A new research series on organised crime in the Pacific has recently been launched. The Global Initiative Against Transnational Crime Organisation are exploring the causes that are driving illicit activities in the region. I spoke with the Head of Pacific Programme, Virginia Komoli, about the series. So at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime, we recently launched this new uh, series of uh, research reports and policy briefs on the theme of transnational organised crime in the Pacific Islands. And and the idea is really to shed some light on issues that are often uh, forgotten or not fully understood, especially because uh, the data is often quite uh, quite limited and, and, and scattered. And what we have been focusing on is really looking at the influence of different foreign uh, actors that are more and more present in, in the Pacific and the kind of of uh, criminal activities and some of these actors are involved in. And uh, the more you look into it, and the more you realize that sometimes, actually in many uh, instances, it is business sector actors that are responsible for uh, for the majority of organized crime, as opposed to those uh, criminal uh, gangs or or you know drug cartels, those that we would normally associate uh, with um, uh, with organized crime. Of course, they are there as well, uh, and and Pacific Island countries have really uh, become uh, the set of you know so many uh, different flows of people, commodities, many illicit commodities. Uh, but it's really oftentimes uh, business actors that are engaging in this uh, in these activities and really making um, huge amounts of money that benefits uh, them uh, and, and that don't really uh, uh, bring any benefits to the islands and their populations. Quite the opposite. The the first paper looks at geopolitics in the Pacific. How has this contributed to the growing problem of organized crime in the region? Well, it has contributed quite uh, significantly. When we started out with, with the research, we wanted to uh, focus on the actors, you know, who are these uh, people, these groups that are committing all this crime. And the more we delve into the research and the more we interviewed people and we were able to observe different dynamics, uh, the more and more often, you know, the issue of geopolitics and geopolitical competition would come up. And and, and by that, I really mean this um, uh, competition for uh, for influence that we see primarily uh, involving uh, New Zealand, Australia, the US on the one side and, and China. Of course, there are also other uh, international partners that have interests in the region, such as, you know, uh, Japan, Indonesia, some European countries, uh, India. But really, I would say uh, the, the, the the most noticeable competition is the one that you see uh, with, uh, uh, with with China. Uh, of course, uh, um, these uh, patterns of engagement in the region have uh, we, we we can see that have intensified in the twenty first centuries. We see uh, many uh, international partners uh, engaging more in the form of um, business deals, uh, security uh, agreements, uh, high level diplomatic visits, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, the more we were looking into these issues and the more we could see how there was a relationship between this geopolitical uh, competition and also more broadly foreign presence and uh, a criminality. And I think if I were to summarize that relationship, I think there are three ways in which foreign presence has an impact on crime. Uh, first of all, you know, we see that in all these uh, international actors that have partnerships with Pacific Island countries, they uh, provide some external support that helps build a capacity to fight crime. So that's uh, that, that that's positive. Uh, but also the arrival of all these different actors and also um, uh, business actors and investments, uh, they've also altered uh, patterns of criminality. And thirdly, all these uh well this the presence of all these different uh foreign um uh, foreign actors also determines the amount of attention that is paid uh to combating crime and and corruption uh and this is due to diff- multiple you know political and also uh d- diplomatic priorities that might impact uh government's appetite to uh to address crime especially when crime is committed by um 
uh, by actors that have close connections with their countries of, of origin, with their governments. And so uh, there are times where those diplomatic relationships between Pacific countries and the countries where those foreign actors are from, uh, uh, or preserving those, those relationships, I should say, actually takes precedence over fighting crime. Yeah, speaking of relationships, how does a relationship between foreign actors who have, they come in with the intention of perpetrating organized crime, how do they even form relationships with officials in local Pacific countries? Uh, well, so th- th- there is a wide range of, of, of actors, but think, for instance, as uh, individuals who uh, arrive or in Pacific Islands uh, as uh, business investors. And some of them, uh, well, many of them, actually, they run uh, completely legitimate uh, business activities. They're bringing, you know, uh, money and, and investments in, 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 on, on the islands, which are very much uh, welcome most, most, most of the time, I, w- I would say. Uh, and so because they're welcome, they're also able to, um, to, to establish, you know, uh, good relationships with the local uh, political and business elites. Uh, some they can also uh, take advantage of the fact that there are uh, diasporas already based in uh, in Pacific Islands from a number of Asian countries, for instance. And so it, it could, that, that is very advantageous. Uh, but what we see is that in addition to the licit business activities that some of these businesses are involved in, they they also uh, engage in illegality. And we see this in a number of industries. And in the upcoming um, uh, reports in this series, we'll uh, detail um, exactly uh, those uh, instances. But just to give you a preview, that is, that is something that you see spe- specifically in the extractive industries, where we are, we, are, we are talking about illegal mining or illegal logging, uh, where uh, these are uh, you know, legitimate business operators that uh, operate in places like Solomon Island and Papua New Guinea, but that in a that also, uh, you know, uh, export uh, timber illegally or they harvest th- timber illegally. They engage in illegal uh, mining, uh, etc. So th- th- you see b- legitimate business operators engage in criminal activities. But then there is also uh, actors that operate in the real estate uh, sector, uh, in retail, uh, in financial services, we've seen a number of cases involving, um, you know, cryptocurrency related uh, deals and schemes, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, um, and 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 I, I would say one thing that is important is I'm not uh, we, with our research we are not uh, criticizing uh, Pacific Island leaders for uh, welcoming these uh, these investors because we fully appreciate uh, the, the desire to uh, uh, to welcome investors and to diversify uh, the economic base of the countries and that it would then support long term prosperities. But there is all there also the the criminal risk and vulnerabilities that come with some of these uh, actors. So uh, it is a very, very tricky uh, um, uh, situa- position to be in, uh, and we totally acknowledge that. You mentioned earlier in our conversation that, you know, the countries that are considered like development partners for the Pacific nations, um, they also provide capability around um, you know, the law enforcement um yes. you know in your view do you think they're doing enough to help tackle organized crime in the pacific organized crime in the pacific had been uh, neglected for 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 quite a long time and this and and one reason for that is that levels were uh, com- comparatively uh, low in regard with regard to you know other regions uh, of the world and then there was this kind of uh, belief that because of the uh, remote geographic position of some of these island countries, in a way they were shielded from the uh, the threats posed by uh, transnational crimes. Uh, that has changed uh, rapidly. And I think um, the responses have not adapted uh, quickly enough. 
uh, first of all, uh, in many instances already, uh, the, the capabilities and the resources available to local law enforcement uh, act Actors were um, uh, limited, and 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 as those criminal threats are increasing, uh, they 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 don't have you know adequate uh, resources. Uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, countries such as Australia, New Zealand, the uh, and the U.S. you know depending on where you, which countries we're looking at in, in the Pacific had long-standing security uh, engagements, providing capabilities, uh, training, uh, law enforcement uh, advice. Advisors and financial and financial resources. So in some cases, lots of you know training, for instance, have been has been delivered. Um, but I think we are still a long way to go before um, law enforcement would have caught up with the speed with which uh, transnational crime is actually progressing, which is very fast. We've seen developments, for example, earlier this year, Fiji reported its largest drug bust, recovering 3.5 yes. tons of meth. Is it only going to get worse before it gets better? Yes, uh, I, I would uh, agree with you. And um, and I think the example that you cited with um, meth, uh, it should really be a reminder that you know, we should no longer think that Pacific Islands are simply a, a tran- transit point in the flow of drugs f- that from the Asia or uh, Latin America are being um, shipped to uh, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, Pacific Islands are developing their own consumer markets in terms of for, for drugs, uh, which is a very concerning uh, development. Also, in light of the fact that in terms of the health systems and put, like rehabilitation uh, facilities, those are really very uh, limited or not available uh, at all. And also some countries uh, are also uh, developing um, domestic production. So you mentioned Fiji, but there have also been over the past few years a number of um, uh, reports indicating that um, laboratories where methamphetamines or so other, other synthetic drugs were produced on, in, in Fiji itself. Uh, so we are really seeing a, a big a change in the drug uh, scene. And, um, and, and so, so, so it's becoming very serious. What recommendations has been made to address organized crime in the Pacific? Yes. So in the final uh, paper in the series, we really uh, look into um, what can be done in uh, in, in more detail. Uh, one thing that I would like to say uh, now is that, of course, there is there is lots that needs that needs to be done. Um, we appreciate to go back go to go back to uh, our initial uh, conversation about the uh, geopolitical implications for 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 the region. We need to uh, accept that those geopolitical or diplomatic priorities are likely to take precedent over over uh, fighting crime in many uh, instances. So we need to find creative ways uh, to approach uh, these uh, challenges that perhaps are less focused on uh, an exclusively law enforcement approach, which can be a bit sensitive from a diplomatic perspective. Uh, so I'm not saying that law enforcement approach shouldn't be there, not at all, it should be there, but we, sh- we believe that it should also be accompanied by approaches that are more geared towards addressing the uh, socioeconomic um, and fragility um, um, uh, situations that are actually worsened by crime, because crime is no longer a law enforce is not only a law enforcement uh, issue. is also It also impacts um, a community from a public health perspective. In the case of drugs, from an environmental perspective, from the case in the case of environmental crimes, and also in terms of um, uh, more broadly um, socioeconomic development. So, so if we look at how we can address fragility. Uh, in addition to the law enforcement uh, approaches, I think that could be a more uh, sustainable and all-encompassing uh, way of approaching uh, tackling organized crime. Are you able, Virginia, to give an example of a Pacific country that's already diversifying their approaches to tackling or addressing um, organized crime? It's because there is a long history of uh, engagement or also um, aid um, 
uh, to a number of Pacific Island uh, countries. I wouldn't want to give the impression that, you know, development programs uh, don't uh, already uh, exist. Uh, I, I think that um, perhaps they need to be better incorporated into the um, crime fighting um, strategies of, of, of these countries. So uh, at the moment, I'm not uh, aware of that integration between the law enforcement and development approaches already happening. Uh, but it's something that certainly I would want to look more into and see how we can also uh, support and, and provide uh, a helpful recommendation for uh, in, in order to put this into practice. Thank you.